so without further ado, let's bring on our guest. Hi, Chris, you're with me on the line. Hello, James. It's nice to be with you. Oh, great to hear your voice, Chris. Yeah, yeah, you're coming through nice and nice and clear. Oh, nice. And like I tried to give you a little intro there, uh, Chris, to yeah. the people, because uh, I know you've got your own radio show, uh, and you you do what I do. You do radio, you do TV, you do mail. I do. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You have a very diverse background, Chris. I, tell me a little bit about you before we come on. I, I know we've chatted many times, Chris, and tell, what's the, you know, it's the enigma of life, I guess, is the pull, the, the mystery seeking, Chris. It's, it's obviously alluring to anybody that's a kind of yeah. awake and aware, but, when does this start for you, Chris? Um, well, to be honest, I, I can't really remember a time when I wasn't interested in the paranormal. Mm. Um, I grew up in a house in London that was haunted. Mm. And, um, you know, my sister had uh, a lot of viewings and a lot of sightings of ghosts. Wow. Yeah. And then, um, well, I, I remember seeing, I'd give you just one example. It was my second birthday, and uh, I've still got the the pictures of I had a big cake in the shape of a two and I remember my mum taking me into the kitchen sitting me down on the kitchen cabinet and there was um, an African man in a striped blazer very smart very very smart wow. with a straw boater and a bow tie and white trousers and white shiny leather shoes standing in the corner of our kitchen um, and I remember, I mean, I was two years old. I said, look, mum, there's a black man in the, in the kitchen. Wow. And, um, you know, obviously there was nothing there, but I could see him and he was smiling, but he was, he was staring straight ahead. And when I looked back, he'd gone. And, uh, I always remembered that. And I always thought, well, that is a very strange, uh, um, experience, you know, and to, to see, you know, when I was growing up at that time, um, you know, you had uh, people from all over the British Empire coming to London to live in London, including, you know, people from Jamaica and Antigua and oh, from wow. Africa. But really, to be honest, at that time and in that part of London, there wasn't really anyone from any of the overseas territories or anyone from the British Empire living in our part of London. And so to see that particular type of character was you know not only was it strange but it was also you know ethnically it's a weird thing to see mm -hmm. well i didn't realize what that was until many years later mm -hmm. and uh, i was researching the life of a really very very influential occultist he was a full-time ma magician his name was mcgregor mathers and he was a member of the Golden Dawn, which oh, yeah. is a, yeah, it's a very kind of, uh, well, for well healed, rich people. Um, they've had a lot of famous members. Bram Stoker who wrote Dracula was a member of the Golden Dawn. And the entire society was kind of sabotaged and taken over by Aleister Crowley. Now, a lot of the Golden Dawn members were also Freemasons. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they had a center that was, uh, in London and they were meeting a, a, a big, uh, Freemason center, which is, uh, the Grand Lodge of England, which is in Queen Street near Drury Lane. But they also had a kind of initiation center in Paris. So I was, uh, you know, writing and I was researching, uh, my first film, uh, in the series of films I've been making since 2007 called Spirit World. I'd come back from Paris and I, I'd gone to the house where McGregor Mathers used to live. And uh, he was a curator at a museum in London called Horniman's Museum. It's a very strange museum. It's a, a collection that spans across many things. They've got giant spiders. Wow. They've got stuffed walruses, which are like, you know, 12 feet tall. Uh, they've got the biggest collection of ethnomusicology musical instruments from all over the world. They've got Tibetan nose flutes and, you know, kind of uh, gamelans from uh, Indonesia and all this kind of weird stuff there. But because he was a member of the Golden Dawn, he also used the budget of Horniman's Museum to actually buy a huge amount of voodoo and black magic equipment directly from tribal people all over the planet. Wow. And uh, I was going up the stairs 
in, in the museum and going up to the top floor with, where they have the top floor display and there was the black man with the straw hat in the blazer with the white shiny shoes and the white trousers wow. and he was a dummy and he was part of a voodoo altar that had actually been purchased back in Victorian times and um, it's been on display there for many many years and uh, he is what's known as a lower. A lower is a voodoo spirit and they come in all shapes and sizes. There's male ones, there's female ones. Um, some of the spirits are very boisterous and uh, they, you know, they possess people and when they, when they've got possession of a human body, they're actually smoking cigars, drinking rum, they're swearing, they want sex with everyone. Doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman. Wow. Uh, these, these spirits, I mean, sometimes they're called orishas. They're, there's lots of different names for different types of spirits in the world of voodoo. And so, you know, that had a big effect on me because I realized that when I was Amazing. two years old back in a house in London, that, that was a voodoo spirit that had come to my house. Hey, Chris. I used to live in Bromley uh, and I used to cycle when I was doing my master's in engineering and research science and society. Uh, I did two masters and I, I spent three years in, in, in Bromley uh, and I loved it there. But I used to cycle past the Horny Man Museum all the time. I used to cycle in by Beckingham and up by the Horny Man and Dulles. Yeah. And I <laughs> swearing every day I'd go in there. Now I want to go. I want to go check this place out. But I used to cycle past it every day. Uh, it's probably one of the mu only museums I haven't been to in London. But. Um, I got so much yeah. to talk about, Chris. Uh, wow, that's really fascinating. That's I guess that's really going to open up the portal for mysteries for you. Uh, I yeah. guess I want to I want to focus on megalithic mysteries. I guess towards yeah. the, end of, the end of the show today. But I know we've got some really really fascinating uh, updates to come through. And I know you're just like me, Chris. You've got so many diverse subjects that you research. Uh, let's roll out with just a little roundtable of exciting okay. discoveries well uh, the, the the reason i did uh, bring up voodoo is because voodoo and i know there's a lot of people who don't like me saying this but this is the absolute truth voodoo is a form of shamanism oh yeah and um you know i know that there's ladies who wear caftans and they've got posters of rainbow colored dolphins on their walls and they call themselves shamans and they live in sedona and when i say well voodoo you know where they're cutting the heads off of goats and they're drinking blood that is also shamanism. They go, oh, no, it's not shamanism, yeah, it's but not all, it is. It's not all it pink is. rainbows and blue elephants. Like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, there, is, yeah, there is some weird, sinister stuff to uh, shamanism, and, and it's like brushed under carpet. It's all supposed to be hippy-dippy in the Western world, but it's not. In yeah. the reality of the, where the shamanism cultures are. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I want to talk, let's jump into Tao with the can, uh, if that's the Yeah, yeah, time. absolutely. There's, yeah. Under, there's underground discoveries there, uh, Chris. Yes, there are, yeah. Let's get into this stuff. This is incredibly exciting. Yeah, well, um, I've got a fleet of drones, and I've been into drone photography, you know, since really basically drones came of age and they were easy to fly. And I've gone for having very, very small drones because I've realized that this, I'm talking about really small drones with HD cameras that mm. the size of a butterfly. Mm -hmm. They are much better for our type of filmmaking uh, with ancient archaeological sites because usually there's nooks and crannies and stuff and the big drones can't get in there. But with the little drones, you can actually release them. Also, they fly a lot longer because they're not using so much battery juice. Yeah, for the tower and the weight. And like, yeah. like me, you wouldn't crash them into tunnels when you're trying to drive them. Well, like you I did, did last crash week. them. <laughs> like I did last You week. do crash them. You crash them a lot. And, uh, you know, you do lose uh, quite a lot of drones when you go on expeditions. But, I mean, that's just the name of the game. Yeah. That just goes with the territory. There's no way you can get around it. But now what we've got is we've got this new generation of uh, crawler. These are micro crawlers. Mm -hmm. And they are all-terrain robots. They don't use caterpillar tracks. They've got like six legs. Spider legs. Or, yeah, they're like spider legs. They're very, very tiny. They're very lightweight. They're very, very economical in terms of their battery juices. Mm -hmm. And really, basically, we've had a huge number of fantastic, mind-blowing discoveries in Mexico using a combination of the micro-flying drones 
the micro crawlers and then there's these hybrid bots as well wow. they're they're crawlers but they can also take off and fly and then they can land and crawl and then fly land and crawl and then fly so this this kind of technological advancement it has already i mean talk about the textbooks having to be rewritten what we have in uh, Teotihuacan Khan is we have a time capsule that's now been excavated. It's in a tunnel. It's underneath the Pyramid of the Sun. Sure. And it is a time capsule that was placed there. We think at the moment that it was placed there by the Aztecs. And you have um, objects that have been placed there which span a time frame all the way from the upper Paleolithic wow. all the way up to the point where basically the Aztec Empire was, you know, really basically finished off, invaded, it was corrupted. Um, you know, I mean, you've got three great phases in the recent history of Middle America, Mesoamerica. You've got the Aztecs, the Mayans, and the Olmecs. Mm -hmm. The Mayan, you know, that is such a tragedy because the Mayans they had a language, they had the hieroglyphic uh, sure. uh, writing system, and essentially they were all murdered. I mean, we're talking about genocide of the Mayan culture by the invading Spanish and by the invading Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Essentially, if they spoke Mayan or they were caught writing Mayan hieroglyphs, they were killed. Yeah. Um what about, yeah. they were also conquered by other, like the Toltecas, they came in and they pretty much oh, subjugated, yeah. they, I think they subjugated them and somehow they get branded as the baddies where their ritual is sacrificed, but that may have been an influence from Toltecs. Oh, I mean, I mean, you can see in Mel Gibson's film Apocalypto that mm. uh, there was a huge cachet in going off and capturing, you know, people, enslaving them and we're talking about blood ritual cultures mm -hmm. all right and that's why i i did actually start the show talking about voodoo mm -hmm. because voodoo shamanism and blood ritual even though this is a subject which you never you I mean you rarely see any reference to it in, in, in any of these museums we know now that the aztecs the Mayans, <clears throat> and most probably the Olmecs as well. These are life force, blood ritual based shamanic cultures. And what we find with the time capsule that's been discovered in the tunnel wow. is uh, artifacts that go way back to the upper Paleolithic. Uh, for example, obsidian, sorry, not obsidian, flint spearheads which are stone age implements these are mixed in with uh, really finely carved uh, limestone and granite statues of individuals that look like sitting buddhas they have oriental features and we we can see over and over again with the olmec culture which is a culture that is it was really at its zenith point around 1600 BC. We can see that there are African Negroid facial features with the large Olmec stone heads. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, the smaller Olmec statues and the Olmec masks, which are made from jade, mm. are more Polynesian, Oceana, Japanese, Chinese in terms of their facial features. And so this time capsule, which we believe has been put together by the Aztecs and placed under and buried deliberately underneath uh, the Great Pyramid at Teotihuacan, is really the Aztecs' way of, you know, like we, we make time capsules to this day, you know, I mean, there's modern time capsules being made right now. There's several companies around the planet. Mm. And they've made a time capsule that you know, it spans 22, 23, 24,000 years. Wow. 
And this has been found using these tiny, tiny robots. The most successful robot is called Tleelock. Tleelock. That's T L A L O K. T T L I L O K. And uh, that's a crawler. But there's also these micro flyers as well. These micro drones. And then, uh, like I say, we've also got these hybrid ones now. They look like little motorbikes, but they've got propellers on them. And, you know, like I say, the smaller they are, the better. the better they are for getting through nooks and crannies. So that is really, you know, I mean, this is breaking news. I mean, this is really what's coming out of it. There are so many artifacts. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of artifacts that are being dug out and detected by uh, the micro rovers at the moment that, I mean, you could fill a small to medium sized museum with the amount of artifacts coming out of this time capsule. This is incredible. There's, uh, there's crystals, uh, there's, uh, stone axes, there's jade axes, there's Buddha like figurines. But, and this is really, really super, super, super important. Let me just have a look at my notes here because some of the Mexican <laughs> village names are very difficult to pronounce. So I want to get the pronunciation, pronunciation right. Uh, is it at Tlilapia? Hang on, let me the just see. Pronunciations of the names are crazy. But they way. are. The spellings are really crazy as well. The, uh, there is course. one place here. It's not Izapa. It could be Tlilapia. Um, I've got it in my notes here, but basically, this is the big thing that I've discovered just recently, and I, I was speaking to the anthropologists and the archaeologists yesterday. Chris, I'm looking at pictures of some of this stuff here online, and I'm telling you, I'll try and put superimpose them in the in the video. But uh, this it, so, it's just amazing. The stuff. Oh, it's, it's the still most dug out of the ground. We we, we kind yeah. of think, we kind of think that where it's all done and it's all been dug up, but I no. mean, I, so basically, this stuff is underneath the. This is yep. underneath the site of Tay with the Can. So we're saying Tay with right. the Can was built much later than whatever this site was. This was an underground ossuary chamber offering ritual yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. Sealed off then like a time capsule. Like the megalithic chambers, they were sealed off after their use. Yes. Like a little time yes. capsule then built the pyramid over top of it. Yes, that's right. I mean, you know, I think that I'm making this new uh, film, Spirit World, which I've been working on for three and a half years, by the way. I mean, it takes, I want to say this to, to the listeners and the viewers, that yeah. if you want to make a kind of cinema documentary, and you want to travel to a lot of these places. I mean, this is not something that you make overnight. It takes a lot of time. If you had all the money in the world, Chris, it still takes you physical amount oh, of time, yeah. time and planning and organizing. Yeah. And also, uh, like with the drone technology that I was mentioning, we have had over the last four, four and a half years since I've been making this movie, we have had one kind of giant digital revolution after another, after another, after another. Oh, yeah. I mean, now I'm shooting on HD uh, micro cameras. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are about the size uh, of, you know, like an AAA sized cylinder battery. Wow. And they are, they are giving me 1080 HD. That's amazing. Yeah. And they're running from um, the flat round batteries that you put in LCD watches. Cells. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, well, they weren't around. Those cameras weren't around two and a half years ago, and they certainly weren't around when I started making Spirit World Volume Three. Yeah, and then with all the drones now, I mean, we've now got these new hybrid drones which fly and crawl. These it's are incredible. these are brand new out on the market. The drone technology, as great as it is, we're going to be under attack with that pretty soon. As I know, one was taken down at Heathrow. Uh, yeah. And I reckon, I know, you know where I live in Northern Ireland, it's a bit political yeah. here, but I, they don't want drones here either, trust me. No, no, that's right. Because I mean, they're already, uh, the Netherlands authorities are training eagles to actually attack drones. That's incredible. Yeah. But uh, obviously, you know, for ancient archaeological sites, uh, as long as you've got the permission, you should be okay with them. Okay. But, um, yeah, the really big find, and this is the thing that I, yesterday I put... Uh, a professor from the uh, National Museum of Baghdad in mm -hmm. Iraq in touch with a team member at Teotihuacan. Now, I met this professor from Iraq 
in the Pyramid of Menkor in Egypt. Wow. And, you know, to be able to put these people together, I think is the most important thing because it's not being done by standard academia. Yeah. Basically, these people are only comparing their notes and only finding out about each other's discoveries through me making my movie. And what we've found now is we've found Ogdoed clay figurines in Mexico, wow. which are facially almost identical to what we have with the Ubaid culture, which is a famous culture that buried artifacts in a sacred mound of earth. Um, and they were, they were called the Ubaid people in southern Iraq. You're the only other guy I know who goes on about these all the time because I'm, I'm talking the same. I know they're on your homepage as well. If you go to Chris, yeah. ChristopherEverard.com, the yeah. listeners will check it out there. But, uh, these are just mind blowing. They uh, are, yeah. Weird, exotic. But there's some of the deepest antiquity of relics we have. Four, I think 4,200 or 4,600 BC? The Iraqi ones, yeah, they're around 5,000 years. I mean, the, the dates vary. And as we know, James, is that there are mistakes within academia. Okay. Okay. And I don't, I don't like the thing where, you know, people just, they write a textbook. The textbook goes into the curriculums in various universities and that becomes the date set in stone because we we can see that these cultures don't arrive and then disappear in a spike in time they overlap each other mm. they kill each other out they're in competition with each other sometimes they join together sometimes they interact and mate with each other and create a synthesis culture which we can't tell the difference of the um, complexities but, are <laughs> they're mind bending oh yes yeah. we are we are a uh, species that is extremely convoluted in everything we do, and yeah. it's never been any other way. And I don't know why archaeology's got to look back and give a very simple, very answer, a simple timeline or a simple set of events when it never ever has been that way. It's not, yeah, it's not us. It's well, not the human race. Yeah, I have to say, um, you know, in the process of making my documentaries, I've got less and less respect for you know traditional academia and traditional archaeology there are museums which have artifacts on display which are so similar to other artifacts on the other side of the planet yeah. and also come from a very similar time frame mm. that it is a crime it's a virtual crime that the curators have not done their homework because the now let me just explain the ogdode the Ogdod are the creator gods. They created through willpower, and the Greek word for willpower is thelema. They created the modern hydrocarbon society, which is the result of mankind. Modern Homo sapien man, Homo erectus, uh, Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, everything that you you consider to be modern man and not a monkey was created by the Ogdod gods in the legends which we find in the Temple of Unas uh, near the uh, stepped pyramid of Djoser in Egypt. That's where the first creation myths of the Ogdod were recognized. And that's they that word Ogdod. again, Og, the Og, or the Og, it's everywhere. Og, it's even well, in Ireland, Og, it's even in Ireland, Chris. Yeah, Ogdod, um, it's been named that because there was eight of them. There were four uh, serpent-headed females who have the bodies of uh, human Homo sapien females, but with the heads of serpents. And they married four humanoid men, but those men have the heads of amphibian kind of frogs or salamanders. And so what they represent... Uh, the three primary and most successful strands of evolutionary DNA, amphibian, reptilian, mammalian, all combined together. That's really what the symbology of the Ogdode are. And where they came from is a complete mystery in the Egyptian legends. They were, they were said to dwell in the 
ocean of none, which is the primordial soup, which is written into these ancient um, creation myths of Egypt. I mean, that there in itself is mind blowing. This is Gnostic it, teachings as well. This uh, this, this might yeah. into the Gnostic teachings, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's mind blowing because you know modern science now recognizes the amoebas is really basically where we came from. We came from a primordial soup, and that is written into these ancient Egyptian creation myths, which are inscribed in hieroglyphs in stone at Saqqara. Wow. Thousands of years ago, they knew that we came from a primordial soup or a primordial ocean, which they called the Ocean of None. Now, the Ogdode gods, the four humanoid females with the heads of serpents and the four uh, male humanoids with the heads of uh, frogs, they somehow inhabited this primordial soup or their souls inhabited this primordial ocean. And through their willpower, they created the first fully formed human. Ra or Atan Ray, whatever, however you want to pronounce it. And what happened is that through their willpower, they made this primordial ocean recede away and a small tiny hillock of dry land, the first dry land on our planet emerged from this primordial ocean. And on that little piece of land, a egg appeared, a flower grew out of the egg, the petals of the flower opened, and inside the flower there was the first fully formed humanoid. That's that's basically the creation myth. Okay. Wow. Now what we find is that when we look at the Sumerian cuneiform and the Assyrian library of Nineveh, mm we can see that the Anunnaki are really, you can transpose the Anunnaki onto the Ogdode. You can see that there are massive similarities going on with the epic tales of Gilgamesh and the writings which were unearthed by Sir Henry Rawlinson mm. at the library of Nineveh. And all of that stuff, by the way, is in London. They actually brought back the entire temple room and rebuilt it at the British Museum, which is pretty mind blowing. Yeah, I just I've been to the British Museum and accessible two hundred times. I used to go once a week for my oh yeah, and it was only yes. in the corner. And I have a lot of it on film as well. I, I'm going to put that up on the channel sometime. Yeah, soon. yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be actually so, in the Pergamon Museum in uh, Berlin next week as well, Chris. Yes, they they they've got a great collection as well. Yeah, and I just came back from the Louvre in Paris, and in between those three museums, they have massive chunks of Sumeria. And one oh, way, they in, do, yeah. In one respect, it's a great that it's preserved. It is. It is really. It is because uh, you know we've had this uh, incredible situation with ISIS or whoever they are. I mean, I don't believe that you know ISIS really does exist as the way the mainstream media tells us they exist, but they've been defacing. Um, the winged bull statues, mm. they're called Shadu. And uh, Babylon, the word Babylon means gate of the gods. And, you know, the big cities in, in Sumeria or Mesopotamia had these Shadu uh, winged bull statues at the entrances of the big cities like Mosul, uh, Basra, Baghdad. And, uh, you know, these things are being destroyed. They, they're destroying them because they're saying that the spirits the jinn actually live inside them, which I can well believe. But, you know, that's a job for an exorcist, not for a bloke with a Black & Decker power drill. Sure. Uh, before I, <laughs> I... I don't want to lose your train of thought, by the way. In your book, uh, Stone Age Psychedelia, Chris, you've got a whole chapter on the Ogdod and hallucinogenic yeah. magic. Maybe you just want to explain the hallucinogenic magic element to the, the Ogdod. Right, okay. Well, communication with the Ogdod is the number one game in town for a lot of these cults, a lot of these secret societies. The most famous network of secret societies or brotherhoods, uh, which we had, that were trying to make contact with the Ogdode all the time, are the pharaohs. The pharaohs, and I'm talking about dynastic Egypt, 
were using hashish, which was mostly coming from uh, the area which is now called Lebanon. Uh, that was a very light-colored kind of sandy, fluffy uh, type hashish. But they were also getting a more oily uh, kind of substance from Pakistan, believe it or not. Wow. And they were also ingesting uh, other types of resin that was uh, being manufactured in Syria. So they were eating cannabis resin. They were also using opium. And all ancient cultures have been using opium. Opium has a, uh, a history which goes back at least 5,750 years. The so-called incense burners that you see carved into the walls at the uh, uh, Palace of Karnak in Luxor, they are not incense burners. They are opium pipes. And not only can you see the opium pipes, and they look very similar to the ancient Chinese opium pipes, um, but you can see the vapors in some of the carvings coming out. And it's in those vapors that the visions of the gods could be seen. Wow. So they had cannabis resin. They had opium. And we also know that the Magi, who are in today's world, the Bedouin and the Berbers, the Magi, who were like, you know, in the legends of the nativity, the three wise men, uh, bringing myrrh and, you know, all the, all the gifts for Jesus. The Magi are the stone age drug peddlers of the ancient world. Mm. And you had obviously gold and you had obviously turquoise and you had obviously jade and these valuable semi precious and precious stones and metals in the ancient world, no question about it. But when we really look at what people were really trading with currency and what was um, the goods that were traveling huge distances with the Magi trade routes, it was the psychedelics, the psychoactive roots, the psychoactive seeds like henbane, uh, mandragora, mandrake root, uh, the fly agaric mushroom, which is the typical red and white uh, toadstool that you see in Alice in Wonderland. This was the main game in town. You could have as much gold as you wanted, as much turquoise and as much jade, but that would not give you the psychoactive telepathic effect of being in this psychedelic hypnotic trance and that's what these brotherhoods wanted and that's what they did all the time and they were using a huge number of different plants syrian rue which is an analog and is very similar to ayahuasca, ayahuasca yeah yeah uh, i think they actually make a brew over that in the in this part of the world chris and they call it anahawaska uh oh. yeah they use the syrian rue as a, as a derivative for the dna yeah yeah, well, Syrian rue, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's a two-part thing. It's an MAO inhibitor. You, need, you know, it's a two-part thing. It's exactly the same as they use Psychodria vidris along with ayahuasca and uh, tobacco leaves in the Amazonian region to actually create a catalytic kind of uh, um, uh, process that allows the DMT to last in the body because otherwise, if you don't do that, it just gets digested. Uh, the same thing was going on in the Middle East. Wow. Exactly the same thing. Now, if you take a look at the, you really carefully look and you go to the National Museum of Cairo or you go to the Luxor Museum, take a look at the eyes in a lot of those solid gold death masks. The Egyptian elite were employing high level priestesses and priests. These people were permanently on uh, a whole calendar uh, kind of schedule of feasts, rituals, and ceremonies. And at every single one of these ceremonies, there would be a ritual which would involve psychoactive plants, psychoactive incenses, opium, hashish, uh, tobacco. And we know, and you can see this in my book, Stone Age Psychedelia, we have absolute incontrovertible proof that the pharaohs, especially King Ramesses II, 
was ingesting cocaine. Mind blown. Yeah. Now, the cocaine plant and the tobacco plant, there is no botanical historical evidence of those plants ever being in the Middle East. So we know that there were trade routes between North America, which is where the tobacco has been used by the Hopi, Cree, uh, Apache, the Blackfoot, all of those uh, uh, indigenous North American tribal nations use a combination of tobacco and sage as part of their form of shamanism. When you go further south and you go into Mesoamerica, you then start getting into countries like uh, Colombia and Peru, and that's where the coca plant, the leaves are chewed, and uh, that gives you this staying power and the wide awake kind of uh, attitude which is necessary for these long rituals. The, now, uh, the German, those plants were, were taken to Egypt for sure. Yeah, okay, so they're indigenous to South America only, uh, but that yeah. implies, well, either the South Americans went to Egypt or the Egyptians went to South America, or there was a trade route where it got passed along A, B, C, yeah. D, and, and whatever got to there, but most likely, I think there was transoceanic contact we have yes. many other examples, like you say, the statues, different parts of the world all uh, linking up. Um, you know, you have Brazilian, Phoenician writings in Brazil and stuff. Maybe the Phoenicians, oh, absolutely, maybe yeah. the Phoenicians were importers. Well, the Phoenicians, uh, we know that they, uh, the Phoenicians and uh, the Assyrians, they monopolized cannabis resin trading. Uh, all the way over the ancient world. I mean, they were trading up into the Adriatic, Albania, Greece, Macedonia, Italy. Um, the, you know, the, the portion of the south of France where I live actually was under the control of Italy. Actually, it wasn't France. You know, it's, that's a, a recent kind of political development in the last couple of centuries. Um, but that cannabis resin... Uh, and also the fluffy dry stuff from um, the Lebanon, uh, that was being traded all over. And then from uh, the Celtic Empire, we had mandrake and henbane. A very, very difficult plant to cultivate, by the way, mandrake. It's incredibly difficult, but it's in the Book of Genesis. The very first thing that you read in the Book of Genesis is that mandrake was being taken as an aphrodisiac. Wow. Now, the book of Genesis, with the whole story of, uh, you know, God said then there was light, and then he separated the waters from the heaven, blah, 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 blah. That is based on the ancient Gilgamesh epics from ancient Sumeria or ancient Mesopotamia. It's one of my favorite epics, actually, that and the story of the Pishmim and... It's just some of the, <laughs> some of the stuff in the Sumerian records, the, the yeah. quote mythologies. <laughs> you know, it's it's it sounds wild, but yeah, this stuff may be in fact for all you know. It's just a label. Mythology well, is just a label. For yeah. Now, if we if we want to talk a little bit about the Anunnaki and the genetic manipulation of humankind and the creation of humankind, uh, what I mean by that is. The basic genetic building blocks of the very, very primitive man, Austro Lepic, sorry, I have trouble with some of these uh, Latin uh, names, Australopithecus. Yeah, on the same uh, row, it's the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah these are the African skulls. They've only been found in frag fragments. They're very, very thick skulls. They are more advanced than a chimpanzee skull, more advanced than a gorilla skull, but they're not so thin and as evolved as Cro-Magnon. And so that is a branch of uh, half, I suppose, half man, half monkey, uh, which died out or was killed off. Um, and we we can see these being dug up in in South Africa. Okay, they, they probably exist in 
Australia as well, but that's another thing. Mm -hmm. Now, what we can see is that all of a sudden, there is this massive, inexplicable jump, like somebody's got into Doctor Who's TARDIS. <laughs> and we've gone from monkey man to virtually modern man in the flick of an eye. And this is still inexplicable. It's still something that the official textbooks from academia dodge this subject. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like... It's like we have this compartmentalized research of our history and culture, and it's all, this is taboo and this one isn't, but it's still in the record. <laughs> yeah. You can ignore it all you want. There's some really weird stuff in our record, and yeah. it's like we have this ostracization of our history where, oh, I don't like it, stick your head in the sand. Sorry. Yeah. Well, this hole or this gap in the evolutionary story of, of mankind is filled as long as you start taking into account the Ogdod, as long as you start taking into account the Anunnaki and the advanced beings like Quetzalcoatl coming from nowhere, or the Viracocha who appear from nowhere, or the great teacher, the great Wangina in uh, the Aboriginal uh, Dreamtime mythology, they came from nowhere, they knew about mathematics, they knew about astronomy, they knew about astrology, they knew about textiles, they knew about weaving, they knew about uh, cultivating wheat, barley, other grains, they knew about making poultices, they knew about psychoactive herbal concoctions like ayahuasca, like a Syrian rue mixed with mint. Mm. These great world teachers, the Nomos, they go under many, many different names yeah. in many different cultures. They plug this gap in the evolutionary timeline. But traditional academia is, you know, in a controlled environment, it's, uh, it's under the control of universities, university dons, you know, a lot of them have been members of uh, these brotherhoods and sisterhoods and Freemasonry. And what I'm talking about is what people pay thousands of pounds to learn when they get initiated into witch cults, Masonic brotherhoods, and other kind of weird cults. I'm just I'm glad you mentioned the numbers there. I just want to bring in uh, the work of Sharon, uh, sorry, Shannon Doherty and uh, Laird Scranton, both Dogon researchers, and they talk the Dogon culture in Western Africa. They talk about the numbers uh, being their semi-aquatic fish gods, the, very, very like the Oak Dove, uh, these figurines I... and uh, from the Ube, just the same, same kind of things, different ends of the earth and. Yeah, um, but I don't yeah. know if you've ever interviewed Shannon. She's very hard to get a hold of, and I, I don't think she does many interviews. Uh, but she has pro produced a prolific body of research, as has Laird. And Laird, Mr. Laird Scranton, is coming all the way from New York to Avebury. We're going to do a conference there, um, and that's on the megalithic odyssey. I was telling you at the start of the show, Chris. So I'm really excited about that. I hope you're going to come to the event anyway. Um, you have an open it, is it August the twentieth? August twentieth, yeah. I'm I'm actually going to be uh, probably I'm, somewhere else in the world. I'm going to be filming. I'm going to be uh, uh, I'm going to be doing a whole load of filming about the Knights Templar at that time, the whole of August, um, because I'm I'm doing this uh, film about the Baphomet, which is you know this being that yeah. uh, was worshipped by the Knights Templar. Yeah. Um, so I've put August aside to get that film done. Uh, I've got an interesting uh, thing for you. I'll share, share with you off here, Chris. You're going to love it. Uh, okay. Because nobody else in the world has it, and you're going to be giving it for free. So because I want okay. somebody, to, I want somebody to do something with the research, and uh, it's it's a bit bizarre. To say All the right. Least. To say the now, least, I'll probably fit in with that little bit of filming. But I wish you. Where are you going for that, by the way? Where, where's that? On the uh, I'm I'm going to be filming in Andorra, in Spain, oh, nice. in France. I'm going to be filming in Sardinia and oh, also wow. northern Italy as well. When are you in Sardinia? 
uh, in August. Uh, I don't know exactly which day because I'm going to go in my uh, Range Rover and go on ferries. Oh, nice. if, you're over early, if you're in early August, let's meet up. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I like Sardinia. I think it's an amazing I've been place. There, I, I mean, I think I, I've discovered some hypogeums there. They're off the beaten track. They just left open to the element. They're like the oh, that's great. Home. Well, I'm going to be taking my Range Rover, so if we meet up, we can drive everywhere. We've got to do some exploring together, bro. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. In, in Sardinia, I found uh, there was a reverberation, acoustic reverberation, about seven seconds in there, and they've cut the same acoustic doorways as they did to the entrance to the temples in Malta. It's very, very similar stuff. Like, I mean, absolutely amazing. Wow. Uh, Sardinia is untapped. I mean, I'm hopefully doing the tour there this October, but uh, in terms of megalithic, it's oh, yeah. on steroids. I mean, it's... It, it, the the Naraji Towers are like a mixture between a castle and a megalithic monument. But they're yeah, not yeah. They're not castles, but I mean, they're like just insane. I mean, they, some of the constructions over there are absolutely jaw dropping. I mean, and, and certainly I don't know if they appreciate what they have or it's a very very poor part of the Italian Empire. Oh, tell me about it. I, I was actually going to uh, move to Sardinia mm. um, about maybe fifteen twenty years ago. This is you know just at the point where the internet was starting. And one of the things that uh, made me not go there is because it was so primitive. Yeah, they're so bad. And it was one of the last places where we had really fast uh, Wi-Fi. Yeah, I mean, the roads, networks over there are so Oh, boring. man, you can't go anywhere in a normal car, really. Yeah, it's... it's well, you can nowadays, but, I mean, 20 years ago, yeah. Some of the no, not even now. I mean, some of the roads we went down, it was just nothing. But <laughs> they weren't even roads; they were like tracks. They're like something you see in Peru or something. And this is European yeah. zone. This is the Eurozone. Yeah, yeah. I have um, to say that uh, you know, I think even Austria was considered a third world country right up until 1969, yeah. because they, they their economy had been damaged, you know, by a history of yeah. Hitler and all this type of thing. I mean, the Europe. You know, yeah. it's it's only in the last 10, 12, 15 years that it's become modernized. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. Uh, the, and with respect to Sardinia, I mean, I think they're sitting on a gold mine as well, Chris. I think they yeah. are just literally, you know, sitting on a gold mine of megalithic. One of the, and Corsica too, about some of the best megalithic stuff that we have. Because I think they, they morphed and they changed, just like the Irish stuff over here. I mean... Some of the oldest stuff here is 5400 BC in the northwest of Ireland. Uh, but then we had a wave of 3500 to 3000 BC. And then it kind of phased out about 1000 BC. But in Sardinia, again, they have some really deep antiquity stuff. Neighboring Corsica as well. And it morphed into the Naraji civilization right into the Bronze Age. And it just kind of kept going where other megalithic cultures kind of died out in pockets. Yeah, uh, It just kept going. And the artistic display that they have over there, they have everything from the rock art... Uh, yes. Figurines and Naraji artifacts. Uh, yeah. Rock cut tombs, although they were probably acoustic chambers. Hypogeums. Uh, the Naragis are a special type of megalithic monuments with uh, holy wells with like moon alignments coming into them. It's insane yeah. the stuff over there. Yeah, I think the other thing is, is the reason I, I chose August is because there is a ferry connection to Corsica. Um, <clears throat> and you can't get that ferry, doesn't run in the winter. Make it early August and I'll team up with you, bro. We'll get <laughs> yeah, the yeah, Odyssey good. road crew over there. We'll do something if we can. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to go, uh, you know, by ferry, like I said, but I'm going to go via Corsica. Mm. So, I mean, you know, Corsica is still a place which I need to uh, um, explore. It's a major part of the puzzle there, Chris. You know, my favorite thing is just walking into one of these little village museums. Mm. Exactly. And discovering stuff that looks like, you know, identical to something like from ancient Iraq or well, something like that. Up in the northwest near Alguero in Sardinia, there's a museum called Sana, the Sana Museum, uh, S-A-N-N-A. Uh, if you get there, go in and take a chance. I actually walked into the wrong building. It was the Department of Justice, and they had, like, uh, uh, metal detectors and, like, machine guns and stuff. like. <laughs> and I was like, I've gone in with my camera equipment, and they let me through. And then I said, which way is the uh, exhibit? And I went, oh, no, this is the Department of Justice. So it's right beside each other. Don't get confused. Wow. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the Santa is it Museum. museum? Santa Museum, yeah. Uh, it's incredible. So uh, why it's not in the capital, Cagliari, I don't know. It, they just kept it a little it made. So there's a big chunk down there, too. But uh, the Santa Museum has a weird skull in there. 
from where mm. the rock cut tombs were, and it's got uh, it's been operated on with tre- trepanation. Oh yeah, uh, and it's got a weird shape to the back of it. It's like it's just like, and it's unusually small as well. But it's like bulbous. At the, it's like a wide wedge shape at the back. I wouldn't call it elong. It's kind of elongated, but it's yeah. It's definitely not really like us. Uh, very very unusual shaped skull, and it's been trepanized. It's been operated on. Well, yeah, that's like uh, the caves of Shanadar mm. in Iraq because, yes. you know, we've got elongated skulls. Mm. This is in my book, Stone Age Psychedelia, but they also operated on whoever, you know, I mean, they operated and the person carried on living because the bone healed after the hole had been drilled into their skull. Wow. Uh, you know, I mean, Iraq is just full of these amazing things. Uh, the, the, uh, Famous skeleton called Nandi, that's his nickname, actually has a withered arm. Now, but but continued to be looked after by this community at Shanadar. Not only that, when the person was buried, they buried them with flowers. And outside the caves, they had their own medicinal garden full of ephedra and other herbs used for healing. So we're dealing with a situation right now where the idea, the traditional idea of the Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon being mm. idiots with clubs <laughs> is totally out the window. Yeah, I know. They they have this stupid picture painted for so long now. People just aren't buying it, Chris. They just don't. They're not having it. They're not yeah. buying it. They don't accept it. They know it's yeah. not adding up. I mean, you wouldn't have to be too awake to realize that anyway. But uh, I think... The internet age is caught up. People can't get away with anything anymore. It's out yeah. on the internet before it's out on the... And don't believe what you read on the TV anymore or see on the news or whatever. Um, yeah. It's just... Uh, who goes to t- who goes to the BBC and stuff for uh, for the news anymore? I don't know. I well, I, I did... You know, I did watch one of their prehistoric blockbuster documentaries uh, about a week ago, and I was just utterly disgusted with it. Yeah. I mean, you know, the people who are making these things these documentaries have an agenda and they're coloring modern society into the storyline which should be based on archaeological evidence. Uh, the BBC tack is to now say that if it hadn't been for psychopaths, modern man wouldn't have survived. What? Yeah, and if it hadn't been for cannibalism, modern man wouldn't have survived. That's insane. Well, if you think about it, if everyone was a psychopath and everyone was eating each other, we wouldn't be here now, would we? There wouldn't be much of us left. Pardon the you know, this idea of cooperation and especially psychoactive, psychedelic, trance, self-induced hypnotic communion with spirits mm-hmm. is so far off the official agenda. They don't, they never go there. Yeah. Chris, we're just at the top of the hour. I'm going to take a little break there for five minutes and we'll be back okay. uh, with the second half of the show. We're going to get into more. Uh, we didn't get through half of the update, so I've got to come back in on that. And uh, <laughs> it's, I just love the conversations with you, Chris, because they just go <laughs> where they go. And I know you're a deeply intelligent guy and you research many things. And that's why I love the conversations with you. And it's just like it's like a discovery as well as an intellectual uh, uh, discussion as well. But uh, take a break there, Chris. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Capricorn Radio TV. This is your host James and uh, super excited with today's guest. It's always great talking to Mr. Christopher Everard. You can check him out on his personal page, ChristopherEverard.com and you can check out his TV content on EnigmaTV.com. We're hitting everything today from uh, ancient cultures, Sumeria, Mexico, megalithic monuments, Stone Age, Psychedelia and Chris's uh, awesome book. Uh, I'm not sure if it's his latest book, uh, but it's a very, very well researched and prolific book as is Mr. Christopher Everett and uh, I just love the content, the way it's produced, uh, it's well researched, well written, uh, plenty of diagrams, uh, images and supporting context, that's always a good thing to read in the fact book uh, and Christopher does it really well. Uh, Christopher, are you back with me on the show? I certainly am, yep. my, my latest book is actually a digital book, it's called Star Gods. Star Gods, sorry, that's right. Because um, I, I do physical books uh, but I also do dig- digital books with you know electronic word search and you've got page gesture swipes and you know because I mean, a lot of people 
they want to have something on their iPad or on their iPhone while they go to work. Because you're not limited by the images you can put in a, in a Kindle book or something, you know? Well, there you go. I mean, you know, I, I do a physical book uh, for certain types of subjects like Stone Age Psychedelia. And I'm doing another physical book now, um, which is uh, really containing all of the new breakthroughs which I've had uh, with the anthropologists from Iraq, speaking mm. with the archaeologists from Mexico. Sure. And uh, I do digital books all the time. So Star Gods is my last digital book, and it's a kind of bestseller. It's a digital bestseller. We've got to meet and up at some point to discuss some of that for Megalithic Odyssey uh, documentary, Chris. It's just a matter of when we meet, not, not if we meet. Yeah, well, um, Star Gods is more about the Venus goddess statues which have been found all over the planet. Mm. These are very strange little figurines. Most of them are only the size of your hand. Mm. They are female figurines. They have oversized breasts and very wide hips. Mm -hmm. well, what's really interesting is they don't have any hands, they don't have any feet, they, the arms are usually short stubs yeah. and a lot of them don't have any heads. Wow. And uh, the oldest one is 3, 000, uh, sorry, 13,300 years, that was found in a river in Morocco, but they are actually being found now. Uh, in Japan, and this really? is a very, very important. It's uh, insane kind of the discovery. diversity of where these things are. Is is the Austria? Is there not one in Vienna a lot older than that? Yes, uh, I've seen one in, in the Vienna Museum in Austria, and there's a security guard sitting with it 24 hours a day. That's how priceless. <laughs> I'm serious. It's well, in its own cap. A Venus figurine that's older than 13,000 years. Oh, I think it's 30,000 um, something. Possibly. Uh, Possibly there's there so is. Actually, well, there's so many yeah. of them. Let me just... Uh, Venus figurine... Uh, there's more, more than 125 Venus figurines in various museums around the world. The Venus of Willendorf. Uh, ah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, it's... Yeah, 28,000 BC, they reckon. Oh, that's 28,000. Wow. Yeah, but the, the, this is the thing. The time frames that these are all found in are like really large epochs and very, yes. very diverse across geographic terrains that it's just a double enigma uh, well they 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 are but my my book star gods really goes into it and what these figures are is that they are figurines that commemorate the genetic engineering of these kind of broodmare humanoid figures breeding now, know, were these breeding machines yes yes they were i think we've talked about that before and um, it sounds absolutely incredible, but when you look at the archaeological evidence, it's right there in your face. I was doing Megalithic Odyssey in Malta, Chris, uh, and I've been there many times anyway, but uh, I was having a little think tank with my road crew, and I, I just I found myself again looking at the sleeping lady, as she's called, and she's like very much like a Venus figurine. Yeah. Uh, although she's not called a Venus figurine, she's got a nickname, the sleeping lady. Personally, I don't think she was sleeping. I think she was dying. I think she was dying out of existence and was the last of a dying breed, personally. Uh -huh. and that's, that's interesting. That, it's just, it's, they call it nickname the sleeping lady because she looks like she's lying down with her in, in the sleeping position with her hands, uh, head of, on her two hands. The way you I lie, lie down and sleep on your side. But I think she was lying down to die. And I think when they threw an offering into the bottom of the hypogeum in Malta, that's where this was found. Yeah. And I personally just think it was the you know, it was a disgust that's it, it's gone now. They were just throwing the object away, going, This is this is the end of an era. And it kinda of puts you back to that antiquity that Malta is most likely. I these dates are really open to subjective yeah. criticism. And like you say, I, I think I've seen I've seen Venus figurines in Malta, uh, yes. in the Louvre and Vienna, and that's the only three that I've seen, but uh, just in person, but I know uh, and I'll open it up at that again, that they're just it's they're everywhere on yeah. different epochs and it's just a double mystery well um, what it was is that uh, when I started when I sat down and started writing Star Gods I really had just started researching the Jomon culture in Japan ah. now this culture goes way back sure. like they've got earthenware pots which were uh, made in 14,000 BC now these earthenware pots they were actually decorated when the clay was still wet they pressed straw rope 
into the clay pots. I mean, this is not a hunter-gatherer society, and yet traditional textbooks at universities would say, well, 14,000 BC, there was nothing around virtually in terms of modern technology, like rope. Why did they have rope? They obviously were tethering animals with it. Mm. They were already settled. They were already making earthenware pots. They were making them so they could boil porridge, make food. They were already very advanced people, 14,000 BC. Wow. Uh and you mentioned the, the, a link before there again. Isn't some of the Japanese stuff like it, the yeah, stuff in Ecuador? These jo I think it might be the Joman figurines, I believe. Um, in Ecuador, I'd have to look that up. I mean, there are. Um, what I was going to say to you, James, is that I've never there researched is... it myself, but I know other. I think some other people have made that claim that some of the yeah. Joman stuff is incredibly like Ecuadorian. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I was going to say is that uh, in terms of Japan and China, because that was a kind of combined culture, uh, they were borrowing off of each other. There was a huge amount of ancient trade between Japan and China. And the two cultures really amalgamated. They only really became an isolated uh, culture as, as far as Japan is concerned at the time of the samurai. Mm -hmm. So that's about 1,100 years ago they kind of split away from China, but before then, in the ancient times, they were trading with each other. Wow. And what we can see is that the whole of Oceania was actually their trading kind of backyard. Sure. You can see Oriental uh, influences all around the planet, as long as you've got the eyes open to see them when you go into certain museums. If you go to the Ivory Coast in Africa, and you go to a place, uh, Gabon, G-A-B-O-N, mm. yeah. you can see ceremonial voodoo masks, which are identical to kabuki masks. Wow. And, and this shows you that there was an oriental trade route coming from uh, Southeast Asia. It was stretching all the way over into the Middle East and then dipping down into the northern Sahara and going across into the Ivory Coast. Chris, we need more people like you out there, brother. We need more people like you looking at all, <laughs> all of this stuff. It's such a very wide, I mean, but we're in, we're in the driving seat. I mean, we have yeah. you know, information at our fingertips. All we've got to do is research and put it together. It's all sitting there ready for people. It's just absolutely. Just, and there's so much of it. It's not like a competition. There's just yeah, so yeah. much of it. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, with Star Gods, you know, when I started writing that book, I was really interested in these Venus figurines. Why did they not have any hands? Why did they not have any feet? Why did some of them not have any heads? What happened uh, is I reread the Epic of Gilgamesh. I reread the Ogdode creation myths from the Temple of Unas uh, in Saqqara. And I realized that if the legends of the Anunnaki or the star gods was true and that they'd actually come down from the stars and they'd interacted with monkey men I don't really like that phrase but I mean you know it sums it up yeah. and that they actually kick-started Homo sapien and, and uh, created this spark mm. this gap which is in all of the official textbooks of how is it that we've got these broken um, cul-de-sac branches of human evolution in South Africa with the monkey men who evolved into nothing and there is no explanation of why they ended that evolutionary branch then all of a sudden there's a gap then bang Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal man are everywhere, Homo erectus and an Homo sapien. It's like, you know, it's like jumping from designing an old uh, Citroen 2CV, uh, you know, one of those weird cars that the French farmers drive, to having a Bugatti Veyron wow. with nothing in between. All right, that is really what the textbooks are telling us. Massive well, that gaps. gap is filled 
by the Anunnaki, by the Nomos, by the interaction of, you know, the world teachers. You know, most of the legends say they came from the stars in Mali um, and in the Congo in Africa. They say they came from the sea. OK, well, that is very, very similar to the amphibian aspect of the Ogdode. Sure. Now, if you really think about the nuts and bolts process, how would you take those monkey men that were spread all over uh, sub-Saharan Africa? We know that because we've got their skull fragments in the museums. How would you physically manage that if you were a star god coming from the Pleiades or somewhere else? You would have to have an intermediary genetic sausage factory where you would have a process of trial and error. You would genetically modify um, the human egg. You would genetically splice the sperm and you would actually have, like I say, a genetic sausage factory situation. That is what these Venus figurines are. They are showing that there were humanoid sausage factory brood mares Many of these figurines have vertical lines down their stomachs because they weren't giving birth normally. There was a caesarean uh, intersection done to extract the fetus by these star gods and it all fits together. If you want to look at it carefully, it's the most logical solution. And these legends, we find them in Mali, the legends are in the Congo, the legends are in Japan, the legends are in Iraq, the legends are in Egypt, and the missing part of the jigsaw puzzle, which I had missing up until a few days ago, was where was the uh, I, this idea of the great world teachers coming from nowhere, maybe coming from the stars, and genetically engineering and kick-starting modern mankind in Mexico? Where was that? in terms of the American cultures, and I found it. And I found it in a little village museum in a place called Tlitlico in Mexico, wow. and there they have the figurines. Dozens upon dozens upon dozens upon dozens of figurines, and as you probably know, James, not very well labeled. These figurines, some of them are identical to the Dogu figurines that you get from the Jomon people in Japan. Wow. Some of them look like the uh, uh, figurines that you get from Iraq. And you see elongated headed men who are alien looking with erect penises inserted into another figurine, which is your typical Venus goddess figurine with no head, stubby arms, no feet. Wow. And that is what you, you're seeing. Now, if you don't go along this route, and normal academia is not is ignoring this, how do you explain the vast quantity of these figurines and why were these figurines buried in sacred mounds of earth? It doesn't add up. The only thing that adds up is when you take into account Gilgamesh, the uh, pyramid texts, the creation myths of the Ogdode, and the myths of the Nomos with the Dogon people in Mali. When you take that into account, everything falls into place. These figurines are telling us what happened. It's not a nice thing that happened, but basically these uh, beings interacted with monkey men. They had a whole process of trial and error that resulted in various versions, version one, version two, version three of modern man, which was Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, Homo erectus, Homo sapien, and Homo sapiens sapiens. And so that's really what my my film partly is about that I'm doing right now, but it's also about the 
communication systems that were used in the ancient world using these psycho psychoactive herbs. I know this sounds crazy, but shamanism and voodoo is the baseline from which all the great religions um, came from. And these uh, teachings or the, the base teachings of shamanism <laughs> were what those world teachers or those star gods, whatever you want to call them, gave mankind. And it was all based on genetics. It was all based on blood sacrifice and teaching that the life force is contained in the blood. And that was the teaching that is the common thread from the Mayans to the Aztecs uh, to the Babylonian Chaldean cultures in Mesopotamia uh, and you also see it in the Oriental world as well. Do you think Chris perhaps you know when you look at your stone encyclopedia book um, do you think that's why we're accessing these entities in the etheric realm is is because that's that's how we're able to access them or genetically link with them? Yeah I mean um, ayahuasca is a really um, you know I mean that is a very important key in the uh, Middle America and uh, Latin America geographical area. You have an analog of that, which is the use of Syrian rue in the Middle East. Uh, DMT, in terms of uh, it, in Egypt, uh, the DMT was being extracted from bulrushes and from the blue lily of the Nile. Essentially, the common denominator that we see across all of these different cultures and all these different eras of time is DMT. Wow. DMT from the lily, DMT from the bulrush, DMT from ayahuasca, DMT from uh, Syrian rue. DMT is the key. DMT is the telepathic secret lever to putting yourself into a uh, self-hypnotic trance which opens up mm -hmm. your your landscape of your inner mind sure. to having open communion with these non-physical entities I don't know how long we got for the second hour uh, Chris but I, I just want to get slugged through some stuff and some I know you <laughs> brought, I, I, I'm just going to jump to the the Jaguar statue of uh, Germany okay, yeah you, you sent me this. I wasn't even aware of this. I think this thing is incredible, and, I, and I'm kind of glad because we're kind of going on a very, very Paleolithic theme today, where this is really deep antiquity stuff. And I think that's great. Oh, yeah. about, I think that's great about the research now is that we're past that stupid 3000 BC window where the origins of civilization was 3000 oh, BC, and ridiculous. nothing existed before it, and everything yeah. else before that is called prehistory, and it didn't exist. So I think we're past that now. And we're just talking epochs that were unheard of 20 yeah. years ago. Well, uh, the Jaguar statue, I mean, when I first discovered that back in 2008, yeah. I, it was so shocking to me. I, would, I was in Germany. I was visiting the Egyptology uh, uh, collection in Berlin. And I went traveling around different towns in Germany. Mm. And this wooden statue, which is the body of a man, uh, but with the head of a jaguar immediately hit me uh, that this is something that is an experience which many people report on ayahuasca mm. and it is something that you can see in the great cultures of Mexico. In the Yucatan Peninsula you have these uh, stone carvings where you've got like a a jaguar big cat with its mouth open and inside this mouth is the head of a man and of course this has you know great resonances with shamanism and with the spirit world what we see in ancient Egypt is that we see shape-shifting going on where a great Pharaoh dies he's obviously got a human body when he dies but when his spirit is bar car transcends into the spirit world he has a different form he might have a body of a man still but he has the head of a ram that's just one example these jaguar headed humanoids are one of the most archetypal common 
um, entities that people report when they see visions on ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. You have serpents that speak to you. You have the jaguar-headed men, and then you also have the bird-headed men mm -hmm. as well, who are pretty heavyweight dudes. Uh, most of the time, anyone that comes across these bird-headed men is they're pretty stern characters. They say, we rule this planet. You are just here as a visitor. And you watch yourself because we're the bosses. You know, this is the type of message that a lot of people get. And they're very shocked by it. Sure. But when you look at ancient Egypt, look at the great Thoth. Thoth is an ibis-headed human man in the pantheon of great uh, entities and gods and beings, whatever you want to call them, in ancient Egypt. So we can see now that there are great concordances. We've got the internet, we've got global communication. We are putting together now, finally, independently of the strictures of academia, the true history of how we are, how we got to where we are now, and what the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Olmecs, the Jomon people, the Dogon, what they were all up to. And this idea that Columbus or, Mon you know, it's this ridiculous idea that the Americas had not been traveled to before the, you know, the era of the Portuguese and the Spanish conquistadors is ridiculous. It is so ridiculous. Wow. Look at those Olmec heads. They have African features very similar to the uh, Ekinawa people in East Africa. However, some of the Olmec heads, they're more kind of like the Polynesian Maori type people. Now, when you look at the trade winds around the planet and you look at them in, in, uh, with Mexico in the center of the map, you can see that if the Chinese and the Japanese combined ancient culture wanted to go to Central America, they've got two choices. They could go either via Oceania mm. and they could arrive on the opposite uh, coast uh, from Yucatan, or they could go across North Africa, down maybe into Senegal, down into Mali, leave from the Ivory Coast, go across the Atlantic, and Bob's your lobster, they'd be in the Caribbean. You know, and I think this is really what's been going on. And the thing I would like to say to, to you, James, and, and this is something which I, I've just been researching now, I've been trying to get Russian space satellite images sure. of the Chinese pyramids. Because uh, they are acknowledged by the Chinese government now. The Chinese government denied them. They put earth over those pyramids trees. and they planted pine trees on them. Yeah. Yep. Now uh, there is a statement, it's an official statement, and they say, well, yeah, okay, these are Z Lord tombs. Okay, so there is a statement now where they have acknowledged them. But the problem is this is that to get really clear imagery of them, you have to go to the satellite websites. Mm. The images that I've managed to get from the Russian space satellite websites, I can tell you now, when you compare these Chinese pyramids to the Teotihuacan site, mm. which is neither Mayan, is neither Aztec, yeah. Sure. These are, this is a separate, uh, this is a whole separate culture, by the way. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. They go to Teotihuacan, they think the Mayans built it. Yeah, they, they walked in, found it, and they say yeah. that they found it, and they just adopted it. Exactly, the same as Stonehenge. Everybody thinks that the Druids built Stonehenge. I mean, do me a favor. You yeah. know, Woodhenge and Stonehenge and Avebury, I want to say this to the listeners, we have got some bombshells coming to us because the dating of these megalithic circles is so far out it's laughable 
Mm. Personally, for me, um, you know, the central, the central great big massive stone at Avebury that got smashed to pieces, that could be, you know, we could be talking about from the time of the Ice Age. You know, well, this is this is really where where I, I'm going. I think that these sites, it's ridiculous. How can you have a megalithic culture making Stonehenge and Avebury, 2450 BC, virtually? You know, I mean, the distance between Wiltshire and Cairo is not a massive distance in the global perspective, mm -hmm. and yet this is the same time frame as the building of the Giza necropolis. I mean, it's ridiculous. Obviously, the, 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 the Sphinx temple, that megalithic structure there around that Sphinx, those giant pink granite uprights, this is much older than the rest of those Giza monuments. You know, we both made expeditions to Egypt on several occasions, uh, Chris, and I, and I totally agree with that. But just purely on the megalithic, uh, yeah. European stuff, uh, yeah. and I, I'm glad you brought up that point because I got serious problems. I mean, I, let, let me just throw out the accepted carbon dates for sites that, that are kind of popular or very well known. So you have Gebekli Tepe, say 10,500 BC, 9,600 BC, whatever it is, ice yeah. age stuff. Then you have Karahunj in Armenia, about 7,000 BC. Then you have uh, Karo Moor in Sligo. 5400 BC, Kirkado in Brittany, 4800 BC. Then, right beside Carol Moore, 20 miles away, 1500 years later, you have an identical site, 3500 BC. And then, yeah. you, and then you have this popular wave of like uh, 2500 BC. Yes. What's going on for a thousand years? Where, why are we getting like. And, and I think the best example of that is, well, like I said in, in Sligo, Carol Moore, Carol Keel, two megalithic tomb complexes or ceremonial complexes that have astronomical alignments to star yeah. constellations same type of crystallized uh, crystallized uh, use of uh, passage Quartz. tombs uh, same alignments same shapes uh, same stylistic features of engineering yeah. 20 miles from each other but 1500 years apart what happened for 1500 years you know and, and i and i just think yeah. that you're when you carbon date something you're only carbonating the last time it was used you're it's carbon, ridiculous you're carbonating ridiculous. the occupants of that monument at the time it was occupied last yeah occupied. well you know you know the dating of stonehenge is based on uh the fragments of uh organic material that were found in the albury holes or mm. in some hole near the slaughter stone mm. i really want to say to the listeners that the druids did not build stonehenge and the way that the carbon dating has been done is that, say, for example, the druid comes along a thousand years after Stonehenge has been built and he has a fire and an archaeologist uh, in the 20th, 20th century finds a lump of the wood from that fire that the druid had. The entire site is then dated to the time when that druid was there. And they say, oh, that's when it was built. This is nonsense. It's such idiotic nonsense it's laughable it really is laughable these sites are much older crazy. just look at them crazy. just look at the weathering at avebury on those giant stones yeah we're talking long epochs I mean, long, I know long, Stone, long time stonehenge did have a there was the the foundation holes or something found in the car park yeah. that they somebody's throwing at 10,000 bc dates for that yeah, absolutely. And also, we've just had the Durrington Walls uh, discovery I was there where the they buried, I they was buried there, uh, I shaped men here. I was there the day they announced it. I was actually yeah. at, I, I was doing stuff at Stonehenge and Woodhenge, and I was actually at Durrington Walls the day they had announced it. And yeah. Apparently, they've known about that for a long time. And they had. Yeah. A, they have Listen, a pro James. They, they have a program of release. They release the information like a program, knowing yeah. that it's outdated, but they won't release this until a certain date. Yeah. That's right. That's right. They've had satellites up in space mapping the thickness of the ice caps for 20 years using ground penetrating radar from a space borne satellite. They, they know where all the diamonds are. They know where all the gold is. They know where all the uranium is. This information is worth not billions, but trillions of dollars. 
they know exactly what is in the ground. They've collected so much data. If they don't know that something is there, it's not because they don't have the data about it, it's because they haven't put the investment into the staff to actually analyze the data that they've collected. Sure. You know, there's a place in uh, Bolivia, in Tiwanaku, and yeah. there, was a, there was a Polish researcher there, Arthur Poznanski, and I think it's one of the great examples of archaeoastronomy and why I love archaeoastronomy so much, because it indicates something more accurate than carbon dating. The only, oh, prob yeah. the only problem is you've got to accept it. Because of the tilt of the earth, uh, we yes, have the, the Chandler, procession, yeah. Well, we have procession, we also have the Chandler wobble as well, but yeah. one's a 41,000, one's 26,000. Besides that, they all add up to the, the sun being off a little bit, but not very much. I mean, we're not talking like stars being off, like 200 years, the stars are off by procession. But the sun alignments uh, were over the corners of the temple. And Poznanski put a date on it at about 1700 BC or 1700,000 years. However, his accurate measurements was with strings and compass needles. So if anything, you could just refine the measurement to maybe 15,000 to 12,000, but we're still <coughs> talking really deep antiquity. And we're yeah. talking that ice age epoch again. And I That's think, right. I think if you're going to categorize stuff, I think around the time of the, the, the ice age cataclysm, that's kind of the great flood and all of that. I think you're looking at, you know, a wave of building after that to probably find the North Pole again, to find the, the tilt of the earth again, to find the, the procession of the cycle and start building the body of knowledge, starting from scratch again. And I think probably lots of stuff goes back to that time frame. I agree. Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> you know, uh, you have to go where the evidence mm -hmm. takes you. And we, you know, with these new little robots, we're finding new artifacts all the time. And the other thing I just want to mention is that um, in a little museum, I've been sent uh, images just recently. I think it's from Cholula. Cholula in Mexico, by the way, has got, apart from the Chinese pyramids, is the biggest pyramid in the, in the free world. Wow. Three times the size of the Giza Great Pyramid, much bigger than the Bosnian Pyramid, is in Cholula. It's massive. And a lot of people don't, when I say, you know, that's bigger than, you know, it's like the biggest pyramid that you can easily go and visit. People don't believe me because they've never been told that, but it's true. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I got one last thing I want to mention. Uh, yeah, in my part of the world, Chris, and we spoke off air about this place before, but it's just mind bending and I want to bring it up because we're going to have a great discussion about it. But Boa Island uh, oh, yeah. in County Fermanagh in, in Northern Ireland. Where Amazing. I it's, it's just bizarre, isn't it? It it's, is the most, I, I tell you now, there are certain places that you visit or certain places you see photos of. It's like the first time you see Easter Island. It's like the first time that you really see and appreciate uh, the size of the monuments in Egypt. Those figures in that field that are just scattered around that field in Ireland, mm. there is something very primeval. There is something so important there, James, that once we get to the bottom of it, it will shake the world of academia. Yeah, it's uh, and Bawa Island basically is near. Uh uh, it's near, uh, well, uh, Loch Erin. It's on Loch Erin, uh, in County Fermanagh in Northern Ireland. Uh, yeah. These strange shaped faces and stone figurines. I don't think they even really know how old this stuff is. Well, they don't. They don't. They, pulling you know, figures out of hats. Thing. But uh, it's deeply, uh, deep within the mythology. Boa itself comes from the Irish Boa, uh, the Celtic goddess of war, and she's very linked with uh she's kind of linked with uh that ishtar figure she's very like that described exactly like that and wow. the, the morrigan uh she took the form of a crow and that the crow's feet of the ishtar goddess goddess of sex and war yeah yeah well did. she's also linked with um uh the witch uh the horrible child abductor child eater uh, that was married to one of the biblical characters in the book of Genesis. Wow. Yeah, she's, she's also linked to that as yeah, well. well um, and so they both at the same time, the Celtic, the Celtic goddess of war was Boaf, 
uh, and that's what Boa Island takes its name from. And she had ho- uh, she had those crow's type feet. Yeah, was yeah. the goddess of sex and war. And that's what Ishtar is. She's shown in the British Museum in London with crow's feet, goddess yes. of sex and war. And I'm sorry, there's just too many coincidental yeah. uh, descriptions there. Um, now, there's one thing I want to ask you, James, mm. about these strange alien type uh, creatures that you see carved into churches and carved into megalithic sites in Ireland. Mm. Looks like a little grey alien. He's got a vagina and he's holding it open. Oh, they've got a special name for them, haven't they? They're yeah. called Shinalig- Shinaligigs. Yeah. Shinaligigs. Yeah. What are they? <laughs> I have no idea, but it's, <laughs> it's like provocative and weird alien stuff rolled into one. Um, I don't well, know. That shape. I, yeah, the, the ovoid shape of, you know. The, the thing is, Christianity in Ireland is bizarre. It's got so much bizarre stuff with it. Christianity in Ireland was a very bizarre, exotic thing because they tried yeah. so much to adopt the local Irish culture. That's why the Irish mythology has preserved the megalithic monuments, and, and not all of it. I mean, I mean does it, we're the only megalithic territory in Western Europe of all the megalithic domains from Scandinavia right down to the Mediterranean. We're the only ones to have a written textual mythology associated with it. And they talked about the, the Shi, and the, the Shi was a nickname for the Dinishi. Dinishi means the people of the mounds. And they let this abbreviated it to the Shi, or the, the mounds people, basically. And uh, uh, the mounds mean tumuli, do they? Yes, tumuli, the people of the tumuli, basically. Yeah. The so, the, the, so when they say people of the tumuli, what they're really talking about, the this is a people. very important thing, the is the, the tumuli represent the first piece of dry earth to emerge from the primordial ocean. Yeah. And That's what they are. Yeah, and they talked about those, and they talk about the entities associated with them, the two... Well, they're the Ogdo, then. They're Ogdo. That's why they look the way they do. Well, they talk about the two groups of people that are associated with these, the two of the Danon and the Fomorians. They were the supernaturals. There was normal people as well, the Namidians, the Caesareans, the Milesians, Gales. Spain. Did you say caesareans? No, caesareans. It's the no, not caesarean like the C-section. No, uh, caesareans. There, it's a group of people that descends as a caesar. Um, wow. But uh, all these groups of people that conquered Ireland, the fur bog as well, the men of bags. Which then you wondered, was the fur bog like the Sumerian people with the bags of the buckets? Or the Mexican well, those little buckets are called citulas, well, and you you see them in uh, ancient Iraq, but you also see them Mexico. in Mexico as Mexico well. Mexico as well, yeah. And bizarrely, that the people of the the men of bags, they were one of they got wiped out. They were the ones that had the ramparts on the west of Ireland, these stone forts. But of all these groups of people that were inter, they, were, they talked about Ireland being taken five times. So we have Irish mythology called. Uh, the Lara Gall and the Heron book, which basically means the book of the taking of Ireland. And they sometimes just abbreviate that descriptive thing to the, the book of invasions, but it basically translates the book of the taking of Ireland. And Ireland was taken five times by five groups of people. And wow. the last ones to take it were the Milesian Gales, were the sons of Mill, Espana. They came from uh, Spain. Uh, the M- Milesian Sp- Spanish soldiers, they came over here and they were one of the last ones to take Ireland. And we're talking deep antiquity here, not 16th century now. Um, so we're talking deep antiquity. And they subjugated the two of the Danon, the supernatural race, which were probably these figurine people here that we're talking about. Um, you know, and they were two, t- and they also interbred with the Fomorian Ogues, these. Uh, these giants, the race of giants, and we wow. Can, uh, so wow, and, and when you I mean, it's like the Nephilim, then the legend of the I Nephilim. I call them the Nephilim, Og, or the Og from Orions, or you can call them what you want. I mean, yeah, the Og. Here's the thing: we have Angus Mac Og, and we have the the, the megalithic monuments are got the word Og in them, especially around uh, Stonehenge. You have Ogburn. All the oh, place, yeah, of course you do, yeah. All the place names in England and the towns that surround the, near megaliths that all have the word Og in them. Angus Mac Og is one of the Angus son of Og. He was a he was a supernatural two of the Danon guy who had a father who was a Fomorian. Um, so you can actually draw genealogy tables from the Irish mythology because it says who was related to who, who married who, who had kids by who. They even talk about stepfathers. The Dagda he had a stepfather who he didn't like. So we're talking about specifics here that doesn't really seem kind of godlike. It seems like more human like or genetically. Yeah. You can able to just see, and you can see the trans, 
uh, you can see the transmutation from mythology to some sort of reality element to this. And uh, when you get into it deep enough, and, and even more bizarre, the Ogma, Honey Melt, was his nickname. He was the guy, he was a poet and a, he was the guy who founded the Irish language. The Irish language came from Oak Ham script, or Ohm, we, we, it's a silent uh, G, so we say Ohm script, like the Ohm as in resistance, so Ohm script. But it's English, people pronounce it Oakham, and it basically comes from Ogma, the guy who invented the Irish script, which was almost like a runic writing with dashes and like a morse code and that's pretty easy to decipher we have all the ohm script very very similar and very especially around that area in boa island as well yeah now here's the thing and this is the clincher chris and we'll kind of maybe wrap up with that but because <laughs> we're going on we're going on a crazy one here but uh the the ohm script uh was converted by the christian monks into a latin alphabet and so they they took the oral history of ireland and they wrote this down uh, at a time when, you know, this stuff was like the Da Vinci science fiction, the oh, yeah. the Dan Brown Da Vinci science fiction book of the day. It was like the most ultimate science fiction you could create or fact. You make it up, you can call it what you want, you can call it fanciful, you can call it mythology, you can call it history. These books were considered history up until the 18th century. And then they went, we don't like it, we don't believe it, it's, it's mythology. Uh, setting that aside, when the monks wrote this stuff down, they were trying to convert the pagans of Ireland to Christianity and they were losing a battle because they were just dogmatic in their pagan beliefs. So they adopted so many pagan customs, they even probably took Druids into the church. Oh, yeah. And there's evidence that uh, a lot of these, uh, um, a lot of these church peoples or saints that we call them uh, are actually probably Druids that hid within the church to, to survive. Absolutely. And Absolutely. when they did wrote... You, did you know that a lot of the voodoo spirits were renamed after Catholic saints and some of those saints are Irish wow. saints? <laughs> no, I didn't. Wow. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, modern voodoo is a synthesis of Catholic dogma uh, that has been superimposed over shamanistic earth magic from Africa. I, I think that's what the pagans were doing. They were taking this shamanism uh, and then they basically lost it because the people that, the Celtic peoples that then inhabited the two of the Dan and these Molestian girls or whatever, they pretty much wiped them out. I don't think it was an ethnic cleansing, like a, a purely war thing. I think there was interbreeding, there's talk about them interbreeding. And that they were the descendants of them, and they morphed with the Morians, from Orians. And it, when you read the the tales, there's so many examples of Irish mythology books that survive. Yeah, that they all are almost exact copies of each other, found uh, in books all across Ireland at different epochs and different times. The mythology yeah. never changed. It didn't even morph because the these Janus figurines that we're talking about may actually be just a throwback to the Irish mythology and they were putting it in stone as well as putting it in writings but they they even have the monks when they wrote it down they were so detailed and so passionate and they may have been druids as well that were actually yeah. trying to survive within the church and they went okay we're going to be you know we're going to be subjugated by the Christianity movement let's hide within the church and try and survive yeah. And they wrote down very archaic terms. They didn't even have the terminology for what it meant. So they put footnotes in the books because they didn't. And had they have understood, the monks have understood fully the full extent of this pagan uh, religion, if you want to call it that, or pagan uh, history. I mean, it was in direct opposition to the church. That would have been just scrubs in the record. So the fact that these books survive, I mean, there's some, some of them are pristine, 12th century. They, they're fragments surviving from 7th century. And one of the best known co uh, books is the, the Book of Invasions that I mentioned. Uh, I'll give you the English names. The Laura Gala Nahidre, or the Book of Dun Cow, it's known as in English, because uh -huh. it wrote on a cowhide. And that was symbolic in itself because the cow and the bull are in the stories themselves. It was actually written in bullhide, but... And that book is almost pristine, and they talk about the, the bull raids and Queen Maeve, and all the figureheads are all there, and all the stories, they're all the same story, they're all the same interactions, who married who and who interbred with who. Yeah. And uh, they're trying to put time frames in some of this stuff, and they say it might have been around the turn of the, cent turn of the millennia, around the time of Christ and stuff. Are, uh, are these Shanila Gig uh, figures only on churches? Aren't they carved into some 
ancient rocks on beaches. Yeah. Um, but I think that the stuff that's in the churches, were, like the megalithic monuments, were also just, they built megalithic structures into churches. So, and they may have took these yeah. and put them into the masonry as well. I think they did. They that's, did. that's personally what I think they did. I think that, you and know, I, the reason that it, it looks like a grey alien holding open a vagina mm. is because that is a message very similar to what we're seeing in uh, the Venus goddess figurines. It's about fertility. It's about some unearthly, unhuman being interacting with the direct uh, fertility process in humans. Yeah, and the Janus figurines, these, these strange, weird shaped, narrow chin, big eyes, these like grey alien looking creatures from uh, Boa Island that we're talking about. I mean, they also have the long, narrow fingers pointing towards yes. the navel, like Easter Island as well. Yeah, well, they, they're kind of cupping the, the area name, where the, the um, reproductive organs are. Yeah. Uh, we see that in Easter Island. We uh, see Gebekli it in Tepe. Ireland. Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, Gobekli Tepe as well. Yeah. I think, personally, I think, you know, and some of these, are, again, some of these Janus figurines are built into the walls of a church as well. Um, uh, and I think I just think that they took what they could, uh, they took what they could and just put it into the the ritual buildings uh, and just said, yeah. okay, we're your we're your new religion. You can have well, a bit. Of, you Vatican. can have a bit of the old. Yeah. Uh, look what yeah. Dar didn't didn't the Persian Empire do that? They let t people keep their own customs, but you subjugated, and you were bound down yeah. to to the king like so. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can go to uh, Saudi Arabia. A lot of people don't know this, but there are megalithic buildings that are dated, you know, I mean, they would be, I think they are dated to about the same time as Stonehenge, 2450 BC or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. But these are buildings made with megalithic menhirs in circular formations in Saudi Arabia. It's amazing. It is amazing. And, and that kind of stuff is... You know, you have to go to specialist uh, people like us because for some reason, as far as the mainstream media is concerned, that is off limits. Yeah. There is a whole area of ancient uh, uh, architecture which is never on the mainstream media. For example, um, it, on the island of Minorca in the Mediterranean. Oh, yeah. The T-shaped uh, uh, yeah, pillars. Yeah, weird. And they're never on TV. Yeah, they never mention it, do they? It's no. like probably one of the most interesting. Yeah, uh, the they're the oldest they're, buildings, I think, in Europe, and yeah. yet they're not on the TV. Now, why is that? And also, there are stepped pyramid kind of platform structures in uh, Tenerife that were meant to have been built by the Guanches, Guanche people. Well, you see this word Guanxi, Guanxi, in uh, Latin America as well. So there was probably a stepped pyramid building uh, culture that had gone across the Atlantic from Tenerife to Latin America. And again, it's not on the TV. Chris, we're way over the time schedule today. What <laughs> okay. a show. I knew it would be like this anyway, but uh, Chris, where can people get your work? Uh, I'll, I'll okay, try and put well, uh, Star Gods, uh, you can uh, get my digital book, Star Gods, and also Stone Age Psychedelia from ChristopherEverard.com. And if you want to watch uh, my documentaries, you know, that have been filmed literally all over the world, in dozens of countries with drones, and you get to see the inside and the outside of a lot of places which aren't on normal TV, uh, that's the Enigma channel. That's enigmatv.com. Um, you know, you had uh, people from all over the British Empire coming to London to live in London, including, you know, people from Jamaica and Antigua and oh, from yeah. Africa. But really, to be honest, at that time and in that part of London, there wasn't really anyone from any of the overseas territories or anyone from the British Empire living in our part of London. And so to see that particular type of character was, you know, not only was it strange, but it was also 
you know, ethnically, it's a weird thing to see. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't realize what that was until many years later. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was researching the life of a really very, very influential occultist. He was a full-time ma magician. His name was McGregor Mathers, and he was a member of the Golden Dawn, oh, which yeah. is a, yeah, it's a very kind of, uh, well, for well-heeled, rich people. Um, they've had a lot of famous members. Bram Stoker who wrote Dracula was a member of the Golden Dawn. And the entire society was kind of sabotaged and taken over by Aleister Crowley. Now, a lot of the Golden Dawn members were also Freemasons. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they had a center that was uh, in London and they were meeting a, a, a big uh, Freemason center, which is uh, the Grand Lodge of England, which is in Queen Street near Drury Lane. But they also had a kind of initiation center in Paris. So I was, uh, you know, writing and I was researching uh, my first film uh, in the series of films I've been making since 2007 called Spirit World. I'd come back from Paris and I, I'd gone to the house where McGregor Mathers used to live. And uh, he was a curator at a museum in London called Horniman's Museum. It's a very strange museum. It's a a collection that spans across many things. They've got giant spiders. They've got stuffed walruses, which are like, you know, 12 feet tall. Uh, they've got the biggest collection of ethnomusicology musical instruments from all over the world. They've got Tibetan nose flutes and, you know, kind of uh, gamelans from uh, Indonesia and all this kind of weird stuff there. But because he was a member of the Golden Dawn, he also used the budget of Horniman's Museum to actually buy a huge amount of voodoo and black magic equipment directly from tribal people all over the planet. Wow. And uh, I was going up the stairs in, in the museum and going up to the top floor with, where they have the top floor display, and there was the black man with the straw hat in the blazer with the white shiny shoes and the white trousers. Wow. And he was a dummy, and he was part of a voodoo altar that had actually been purchased back in Victorian times. And um, it's been on display there for many, many years. And uh, he is what's known as a loa. A loa is a voodoo spirit. And they come in all shapes and sizes. There's male ones, there's female ones. Um, some of the spirits are very boisterous and, uh, they, you know, they possess people. And when they, when they've got possession of a human body, they're actually smoking cigars, drinking rum, they're swearing, they want sex with everyone. Doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman. Wow. Uh, these, these spirits, I mean, sometimes they're called orishas. They're, there's lots of different names for different types of spirits in the world of voodoo. And so, you know, that had a big effect on me because I realized that when I was Amazing. two years old back in a house in London, that that was a voodoo spirit that had come to my house. Hey, Chris, I used to live in Bromley uh, and I used to cycle when I was doing my master's in engineering and research science and society. Uh, I did two masters and I spent three years in, in, in Bromley uh, and I loved it there. But I used to cycle past the Horny Man Museum all the time. I used to cycle in by Beckingham and up by the Horny Man and Dulles. Yeah. Man. And I swearing every day I go in there. Now I want to go. I want to go check this place out. But I used to cycle past it every day. Uh, it's probably one of the mu only museums I haven't been to in London. But um, I got so yeah. much to talk about, Chris. Uh, wow, that's really fascinating. That's I guess that's really going to open up the portal for mysteries for you. Uh, I yeah. guess I want to sp I want to focus on megalithic mysteries. I guess towards yeah. the, end of, the end of the show today. But I know we've got some really really fascinating uh, updates to come through and i know you just like me chris you've got so many diverse subjects that you research uh, let's roll out with just a little round table of exciting okay. discoveries well uh, the, the the reason i did uh, bring up voodoo is because voodoo and i know there's a lot of people who don't like me saying this but this is the absolute truth voodoo is a form of shamanism oh yeah and, um, you know, I know that there's ladies who wear caftans and they've got posters of rainbow colored dolphins on their walls and they call themselves shamans and they live in Sedona. And when I say 
Well, voodoo, you know, where they're cutting the heads off of goats and they're drinking blood, that is also shamanism. They go, oh, no, it's not shamanism, yeah, it's but not all, it is. It's not all it pink is. rainbows and blue elephants. Like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, there, is, yeah, there is some weird, sinister stuff to uh, shamanism, and, and it's like brushed under carpet. It's all supposed to be hippy-dippy in the Western world, but it's not. In yeah. the reality of the, where the shamanism cultures are. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I want to talk, let's jump into Teo with the can, uh, if that's the pronunciation. Yeah, yeah, can. absolutely, there's under, yeah. There's underground discoveries there, uh, Chris. Yes, there are, yeah. Let's get into this stuff. This is incredibly exciting. Yeah, well, um, I've got a fleet of drones, and I've been into drone photography, you know, since really basically drones came of age and they were easy to fly. And I've gone for having very, very small drones because I've realized that this, I'm talking about really small drones with HD cameras that are the size of a butterfly. Mm -hmm. They are much better for our type of filmmaking uh, with ancient archaeological sites because usually there's nooks and crannies and stuff and the big drones can't get in there. But with the little drones, you can actually release them. Also, they fly a lot longer because they're not using so much battery juice. Yeah, put the power in the way. And like, yeah. like me, you wouldn't crash them into tunnels when you're trying to drive them. Well, like you I did, did last crash week. them. <laughs> like I did last You do week. crash them. You crash them a lot. And, uh, you know, you do lose uh, quite a lot of drones when you go on expeditions. But, I mean, that's just the name of the game. Yeah. That just goes with the territory. There's no way you can get around it. But now what we've got is we've got this new generation of uh, crawler. These are micro crawlers, mm -hmm. and they are all-terrain robots. They don't use caterpillar tracks. They've got like six legs. Spider legs. Or, yeah, they're like spider legs. They're very, very tiny. They're very lightweight. They're very, very economical in terms of their battery juices. Mm -hmm. And really, basically, we've had a huge number of fantastic, mind-blowing discoveries in Mexico using a combination of the micro flying drones, the micro crawlers, and then there's these hybrid bots as well. Wow. They're, they're crawlers, but they can also take off and fly. And then they can land and crawl and then fly, land and crawl and then fly. So this, this kind of technological advancement it has already So without further ado, let's bring on our guest. Hi, Chris. You're with me on the line. Hello, James. It's nice to be with you. Oh, great to hear your voice, Chris. Yeah, yeah. You're coming through nice and nice and clear. Oh, nice. And like I tried to give you a little intro there, uh, Chris, to yeah. people, because uh, I know you've got your own radio show. Uh, and you're on, you do what I do. You do radio, you do TV, you do mail. I do. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You have a very diverse background, Chris. I, tell me a little bit about you before we come on. I, I know we've chatted many times, Chris, and what's the you know it's the enigma of life i guess is the puzzle the, the mystery seeking chris it's it's obviously alluring to anybody that's a kind of yeah. awake and aware but when does this start for you chris um well to be honest I, I can't really remember a time when i wasn't interested in the paranormal mm. um i grew up in a house in london that was haunted mm. and um you know, my sister had uh, a lot of viewings and a lot of sightings of ghosts. Wow. Yeah. And then, um, well, I, I remember seeing, I'd give you just one example. It was my second birthday, and uh, I've still got the, the pictures of, uh, I had a big cake in the shape of a two, and I remember my mum taking me into the kitchen, sitting me down on the kitchen cabinet, and there was um, an African man, in a striped blazer, very smart, very, very smart, wow. with a straw boater and a bow tie and white trousers and white shiny leather shoes standing in the corner of our kitchen. Um, and I remember, I mean, I was two years old. I said, look, mum, there's a black man in the, in the kitchen. Wow. And, um, you know, 
obviously there was nothing there, but I could see him and he was smiling, but he was, he was staring straight ahead. And when I looked back, he'd gone. And, uh, I always remembered that and I always thought, well, that is a very strange, uh, um, experience, you know, and to, to see, you know, when I was growing up at that time, I mean, talk about the textbooks having to be rewritten. What we have in uh, Teotihuacan Khan is we have a time capsule that's now been excavated. It's in a tunnel. It's underneath the Pyramid of the Sun. Sure. And it is a time capsule that was placed there. We think at the moment that it was pl placed there by the Aztecs. And you have um, objects that have been placed there which span a time frame all the way from the upper Paleolithic wow. all the way up to the point where basically the Aztec Empire was, you know, really basically finished off, invaded, it was corrupted. Um, you know, I mean, you've got three great phases in the recent history of Middle America, Mesoamerica. You've got the Aztecs, the Mayans, and the Olmecs. Mm -hmm. The Mayan, you know, that is such a tragedy because the Mayans they had a language, they had the hieroglyphic uh, uh, writing system, and essentially they were all murdered. I mean, we're talking about genocide of the Mayan culture by the invading Spanish and by the invading Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Essentially, if they spoke Mayan or they were caught writing Mayan hieroglyphs, they were killed. Yeah. Um what about, yeah. they were also conquered by other, like the Toltecas, they came in and they pretty much oh, subjugated, yeah. they, I think they subjugated them and somehow they get branded as the baddies where their ritual is sacrificed, but that may have been an influence from Toltecs. Oh, I mean, I mean, you can see in Mel Gibson's film Apocalypto that mm. uh, there was a huge cachet in going off and capturing, you know, people, enslaving them and we're talking about blood ritual cultures mm -hmm. all right and that's why i i did actually start the show talking about voodoo mm -hmm. because voodoo shamanism and blood ritual even though this is a subject which you never you I mean you rarely see any reference to it in, in, in any of these museums we know now that the aztecs the Mayans, <clears throat> and most probably the Olmecs as well. These are life force, blood ritual based shamanic cultures. Mm. 